So I think I'll start off just noting, as Ed mentioned, that we're going to be celebrating Israel's 70th birthday this spring. And if you reflect back on it, uh, there's so many miraculous things that have happened that wouldn't have been anticipated 70 years ago in terms of the state ensuring its survival of its population growing nine, ten times over and being a true in-gathering place from Jews from all over the world uh, who needed a safe haven. Uh, it became an economic miracle, being the startup nation of the world, which has so many medical innovations and entrepreneurship and so forth. Uh, it is just doing amazing. It's number 17 in the UN Human Development Index uh, and is an OECD country. So if you look at a country that hasn't been at peace uh, truly for a single day and has had so many challenges to deal with, uh, there's certainly a lot to be proud of in terms of celebrating its 70th birthday. On the other hand, as many of us know, there are continual challenges in terms of social and political cleavages within the country, right? Between secular and religious and Palestinian and Jews, growing economic inequalities, and still 70 years later, uh, not having peace with all of its neighbors and not having internationally recognized boundaries. So there's a lot of challenges ahead, and those challenges seem to be magnified by the real turmoil uh, and almost implosion of the Middle East in the past few years, right? Where we see civil wars in Yemen and Libya and heart-wrenching uh, civil war in Syria. We see non-state actors um, spreading uh, across the region. And of course, most of Israel's uh, battles and wars have been with those non-state actors of the past a couple decades. Uh, and so you see a region in which sovereignty and state boundaries are being challenged and in which there's a tremendous amount of war and suffering and refugees. Uh, and where how that relates to Israeli leadership is even today, when you look at how these Israeli leaders are interpreting and viewing their environment, so how are they viewing Israel at 69, 70 amidst this region in turmoil, they view it in drastically different ways, uh, which I think is worth examining why that is, right? So if you look, for instance, on one hand, at the current Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, the turmoil, the immense turmoil in the region uh, reinforces for him the risks of a peace agreement with the Palestinians and an eventual Palestinian state, where he sees those risks as profound and fears that a new Palestinian state would also be in civil war or would be unstable or would be taken over by Hamas and that therefore the peace agreement wouldn't be stable or sustainable. And so his view of the risk of such an agreement has only increased over the past few years and he's made many statements to that effect, right? Whereas on the other hand, um, another Israel's great statesman, Shimon Peres, who passed away unfortunately just over a year ago at I think age 93, um, and, uh, and former Prime Minister Ehud Barak, who seems to have ambitions, uh, future uh, political ambitions again, who was speaking at the Saban Center in the Washington Institute, uh, no, at the Brookings Institute in Washington DC yesterday, both Paris and Barack use very dramatic language to illustrate a very different view of what the turmoil in the region means for Israeli foreign policy, right? Whereas Paris in the summer of 2016, before he passed away in September, was saying that Israel was hitting a wall and it was galloping toward uh, a period where it would lose or threaten its ex existence as a Jewish and democratic state. And um, so the urgency in this turmoil in the Middle East of even more so uh, it being urgent that Israel reach an agreement with uh, the Palestinian Authority as soon as possible. And Ehud Barak uses that very dramatic language over and over again, where he has likened Israel to a Titanic that's about to hit an iceberg. Or he talks in the aftermath of the tsunami in Japan about Israel going to be facing a diplomatic tsunami if it doesn't urgently and seriously uh, try to reach a, a peace agreement with the Palestinians. And he was using that kind of language yesterday, reminiscent of Shimon Peres, Again, so here you see the urgency in both Netanyahu's speeches and in Shimon Peres and Ehud Barak's speeches about the 
uh, effects of the turmoil in the region, right? Where on one hand, Netanyahu thinks this is the wrong time <laughs> to be trying to achieve a peace agreement and it will almost be suicidal. And Shimon Peres and Ehud Barak having a very drastically different view, saying all the more reason uh, given this turmoil to urgently pursue peace. So I think what I'm gonna do is even though I started kind of with varied visions for today, I'm gonna go back and go through about six different prime ministers and how ideology and personality help us understand why, even under similar circumstances, they view the environment so differently, even though they started from somewhat similar positions. And I'll focus in on their attitudes and policies towards the Palestinian Liberation Organization and then the Palestinian Authority. Now, correctly, many would argue, and Dennis Ross among others, that given the turmoil in the region, it proves the point that resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not going to solve the wars in Syria or Yemen or Libya or Iraq, right? Uh, none of these wars have anything to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So it's correct to say, and many would say, given all the other troubles, uh, why focus on this? But it's been a, an ongoing, um, uh, ongoing conflict for Israel that some like Ehud Barak think is the heart of the problem in terms of the conflicts that Israel has to deal with that's even more potentially an existential problem than even the threat of Iran. Well, Netanyahu, of course, thinks, no, it's Iran, and it's not necessarily a Palestinian issue. Maybe we'll have uh, some time to talk about these things afterwards. So because I'm a focusing on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I'm looking at prime ministers from the time that the PLO started changing in a more formal way, right? So all these prime ministers at the beginning opposed recognizing the PLO, opposed the establishment of a Palestinian state, um, focused on military deterrence to secure Israel, uh, and thought that concessions might be uh, perceived as a sign of weakness that would only be capitalized on, right? Uh, but many, some of these prime ministers made a dramatic change in this regard and helped kind of establish and move peace process forward and accepted a two-state solution. And others were much more reluctant to do so. And they, I, as I would argue, they faced kind of the same changes in the PLO. So in 1988, the Palestine Liberation Organization acquiesced to American conditions, the conditions that the U.S. has now for Hamas, that the PLO uh, recognized Israel at least in 67 borders, and I want a Palestinian state alongside as opposed to instead of Israel, that it renounced tactics of terror, um, and that it would be willing to live in, in peace alongside Israel, right? So the PLO in 1988 at least started to proclaim officially that it would accede to these conditions, right, which paved the way for the Oslo peace process in 1993. So I'm going to start, I'm looking, at, in the book, I look at four different ideological factors and four different personality factors, all of whom in different ways and in combination, I think can help explain why it is that some prime ministers went through this significant dramatic change and others did not, and why they perceived the same situation so differently. Um, so I'm only gonna highlight some of them because I, otherwise I would keep you here for several hours. So I'll only highlight some things and I won't talk about all the components that I talk about in the book. So I'll start off with Yitzhak Shamir, right? Because he was the prime minister in the 1980s, um, at, in the late 80s and mid 80s, at the time of the first Intifada or Palestinian uprising that started in 1986 um, and that continued for several years and uh, through the 1988 PLO proclamation. If you look at his ideology, and for all the Israeli prime ministers, they were highly committed to their respective ideologies, right? They were the founders of the state of Israel, right? The George Washingtons, Thomas Jeffersons, etc. if you think about it, for such a young state. Um, they were steeped in ideology growing up. From an early, early age, they would join youth groups, and as many of you know, 
uh, and Israel youth groups are tied to particular political parties, right? So from age five on, you go to a political party that's tied to a political ideology. Even, and even more so, um, some of these prime ministers even joined the Israel Defense Forces or the precursors of that, the Haganah, at age 14 or 15, and were kind of uh, secretary generals of their uh, youth uh, wings by the time they were 17, right? So they were profoundly influenced by ideology through their schools, through their communities, schools tied to ideologies and so forth. Now, with Yitzhak Shamir, he was not only tied to an idea, ideology, but argue, argue, I would argue he was an ideologue, right? Someone for whom policy is directly influenced by ideology and who's actually willing to lose power rather than sacrifice any elements of the ideology, as arguably he did in 1992, where Bush, the father, was saying, you're not going to get loan guarantees if you don't free settlements. Um, he knew uh, that he was facing an election. This was being played in the election. The Israelis were very concerned about uh, tarnishing the relationship with the U.S. Uh, he knew that he might be sacrificing his seat in terms of being prime minister by not compromising at all on this issue, and he wouldn't compromise anyway, because that's how tied he was to his particular version of ideology, which not only was influenced by revisionist Zionism in the 1920s and 1930s that talked about keeping the whole land of Israel, the greater land of Israel, and so forth. But he worked for the underground, right? Uh, the Lehi and the Stern Gang, which was even uh, more extreme in fighting the British um, than uh, some of the revisionists were themselves. So what I'm looking at ideology in particular for him is how the ideology perceives time. So for instance, if you have an ideology where you think that your side will eventually win, whether it be in 100 years or 200 years or 75 years, the time is on your side, right? That's one factor that I'm going to look at in looking at Yitzhak Shamir. Um, and what I argue there is that all of us have a very hard time changing our minds about anything that we care about, right? Uh, whether it's a particular policy or who we voted for or um, whatever it is, what team you're rooting for. Um, we have a very hard time changing our minds about things we care about, all of us, in terms of the field of psychology. And so one of the ways you might change your policy or change your perception of a situation is if you think that a policy has failed, right? But, and this is the but in terms of ideology, if you have this ideology where you think in the very long term you will win, you're less likely to recognize a policy failure uh, that then will spur kind of a recognition for change. Right? So one example of this, for instance, is the first intifada or the Palestinian uprising from 1986 on. Uh, there, um, Israel tried to use force to, to clamp down on the uprisings, and all the generals were saying it's not really working. And with Rabin, Yitzhak Rabin, which I'll get to, he learned from that that this one tactic wasn't working, his generals were telling him it wasn't working, and that was one of several reasons why he turned to taking more seriously the option of political negotiations with the Palestinians as an aftermath of that recognition. I had the opportunity, by the way, to conduct over 100 interviews over a 10-year period with the, often the prime ministers themselves, um, their wives, their siblings, their closest advisors, their political enemies, their close friends when they were growing up, and tried to tease out, in, in addition to archival material on what they said in closed-door meetings, um, as to how they were viewing things. So I interviewed Yitzhak Shamir. Uh, he was very pleasant, personable. Uh, person, and I asked him whether he thought the intifada or the policies to stop the intifada were working. And he said, yeah, they're working. Um, even if they haven't worked in four or five years, doesn't mean they're not going to work. Um, it, you know, they could, you know, he could be gone in the next six months, Arafat, or even if it took 20 years, 30 years, um, his time frame was much different, right, uh, than someone like uh, Yitzhak Rabin. So he, uh, he didn't look at the Intifada and think, 
oh, our policies aren't working in quelling it, we have to turn to political negotiations. And one reason he didn't is because he believed in this one perspective that he gets from his particular ideology. Another reason that I'll mention or select is individual time orientation, right? So all of us, even now, if you're getting distracted by what I'm saying, you have thousands of thoughts going through your mind, right? And some of them are what you're doing today what you did today, some of them what you may have done 10 years ago, some of them what you plan to do 10 years from now. And all of us have these thoughts going through our minds every day. Psychologists claim that some of us spend a higher percentage of our time focused or thinking of past, um, some of us in the present and some of us in the future. So I would argue that Yitzhak Shamir spent the uh, higher, is this bothering you, this thing? Is it because I'm moving closer? So I just have to sense that I move too much. Okay, so I have to stand like a golem, okay, like a statue, okay. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so, so I would say if you're kind of immersed more in the past and it's one that you're emotionally tied to, it's a past of violence, and you think that the past repeats itself, then that can be a hindrance to assessing new information as it comes in. So for instance, with Yitzhak Shamir, he was very much, if you look at his speeches, if you look at his comments, if you look at what he says uh, to other people, he's constantly making references to ancient Israel, to Roman times, to the Holocaust. Uh, and so I can't even turn my head. I just have to, I can't even look at you guys. I just have to look straight ahead. Uh, so, uh, you know, unfortunately, as many, some of you know, his whole family was murdered in the Holocaust and he was the only one to have uh, come to Israel and he was heavily affected by that as well. Uh, but he was also referring to World War II, the Holocaust, ancient Israel, and he saw this as a perpetual cycle of persecution in which there's always uh, someone who wants to destroy Israel. And he was convinced that the Intifada wasn't something of a different nature. It wasn't a political uprising. Uh, his famous quote is, the Arabs are the same Arabs and the sea is the same sea. So he was convinced, and when I asked him about this as well, uh, that uh, all the Intifada showed was the same old motivation uh, that Palestinians want to destroy Israel and will destroy Israel. Right, so he didn't look at the 1988 proclamation or the Oslo Accords after that, Oslo I and Oslo II, as uh, evidence that the PLO was willing to recognize Israel, but rather he thought that they can't change, they won't change, that the past repeats itself, and therefore that uh, he didn't recognize any kind of even ambiguous change that they were undergoing, right? If I move to Yitzhak Rabin, this is a dramatic case. As many of you remember, even looking at that same first intifada from 1986 on, he was defense minister at the time. And the Peace Now movement, which at one time was Israel's largest social movement in Israel, was demonstrating for his resignation when he was defense minister, because they thought he was too hard-handed in repressing the intifada. And then five years later, the same people who support Peace Now were in tens of thousands demonstrating for him in support of him for the Oslo Accords and he is awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And unfortunately that very same night when he's singing a song of peace and he puts it in his breast pocket, uh, his assassin shot him through that uh, song of peace. But a dramatic sh change in five years where the same people who are demanding his reg resignation when he's defense minister, five years later are all demonstrating in support of his dramatic changes in policy. So what enabled that on the part of Rabin? And again, there's eight elements that I look at, but I'll concentrate on only a couple that I mentioned with Yitzhak Rabin. Because he was of a Labor Party ideology in which Ben-Gurion thought that time can work for or against Israel. It's not that time is necessarily always on Israel's side. He increasingly thought that Israel had a narrow window of opportunity to reach a political solution and that the time was starting to work against Israel, right? And he didn't have this long-term optimistic view in his ideology of time that Israel would eventually, time is on its side and it would overcome. 
but rather uh, uh, he was deeply affected by the Intifada and thought, no, this is something of a different nature. Um, the military techniques aren't working. We really need a political solution. Um, and this uprising shows kind of the degree of nationalism and grassroots involvement, also in terms of civilians and women and children. And he started to believe that they were changing their goals and tactics and, and taking that more seriously. So part of that, right, is that he was willing to recognize failure in terms of putting down the Intifada. And two, uh, he had a present orientation. So he wasn't immersed in the past. Uh, he was looking at information incrementally as it came in each day, and so therefore he was slow to change, but he was more able to change his view of the Palestinians, and he was really affected by these dramatic events like the Intifada and the first Gulf War, which I can talk about, but I'm going through, going through it more quickly. Now, if you look at Shimon Peres, the same thing, right? He started off developing Israel's nuclear program, uh, writing books such as David Sling's, which emphasize Israel's military deterrence, and then moving, if you look at the books, he writes to the New Middle East, the future of Israel, um, focusing much more on economic integration, thinking that the EU could be a model for the Middle East and Israel, and eventually, if you have economic cooperation, it can build political trust, and maybe in the long term eventually even security communities, right? And he also gets the Nobel Peace Prize. So how and why does he go through this dramatic shift? And for him, it's somewhat different than for Rabin, and I'm gonna focus on two things here. Um, one is his future orientation. So he's constantly talking about the future and future trends. And he's very eloquent. I had the opportunity to interview him three times over different years. He's very poetic in his language. And he'll say things like, uh, why did God put eyes in the front of our uh, faces rather than the back? Because we always have to be looking forward. Uh, we're actually never in a car in the driver's seat. We're always in the back seat of a boat in that uh, events happen so quickly and we're always slow to adapt to them. Uh, and he was noted by many other politicians around the world for and recognized for constantly thinking about the future and talking about the future, right? So how does this impact change? change. Well, for him, he was constantly looking at future trends. And so one of the things that he concluded was that territory in terms of strategic depth is less important uh, in the age of missiles uh, that you can come in during the first Gulf War from uh, 700 miles or more away. So therefore, if you have 20 or more kilometers for strategic depth, it doesn't matter. He thought territory was less important in the age of terrorism. It's not going to have as much protection as in conventional warfare in terms of uh, tanks. And he started to believe this very early. And therefore, he actually made a private decision to talk to the PLO uh, in the early 80s, so often 10 years before Rabin made that decision, by looking to some extent at these future trends and uh, also being willing to take risks with that. He didn't announce it publicly because the public yet wasn't uh, ready uh, to hear that. And it, when I asked him, well, what he, you know, he doesn't mention the Intifada ever in his books or his speeches, what impact, if any, it didn't have any impact on me. Um, I already thought we should talk to the PLO. So these, these dramatic events that really shook up Rabin and that for Shamir only confirmed his previous views um, also didn't affect uh, Paris, who had a, a much uh, more orientation in terms of future trends that oriented him. Uh, so I could talk about him much more, but I'm trying to move forward and talk a little bit about Ehud Barak. Um, as many of you know, he was the most decorated soldier in Israeli history, had gone through uh, the IDF, kind of won in 2001 uh, by a real majority in terms of Israeli politics, was very respected, uh, had a lot of support, and ran on the platform of carrying forward Yitzhak Rabin's uh, agenda and promised to reach peace with the Palestinians within a year or two um, and took advantage of the fact that and, and, and announced that he was Rabin's protege who's going to carry on uh, Rabin's work uh, and had the real serious intention of doing so. So he also had made dramatic shifts from earlier periods. He had opposed 
Oslo won. He had abstained and voted against uh, the Oslo Accords. Um, so he also started out from a position of real skepticism. And I would argue, again, because of these ideological reasons um, and his openness uh, to new ideas and so forth, which I could expand on with time, uh, he was able to change. So one question, though, with Barack is, why, when he had so much support uh, on a peace platform, that he only last 18 months in office and wasn't able to carry that out? Uh, and one of the reasons that, as I did my research, that I'll talk briefly about is something called emotional intelligence. Uh, and so apparently, Barack has a very high IQ. It's over 140. Uh, he's a master piano player. There are legends about the fact, even when he was growing up, that he could dismantle watches and clocks and locks, you know, 100 in an hour. I don't know if those figures are accurate, but really seen as a uh, brilliant person. Uh, Yet, uh, and he recognizes this himself, he's not very sensitive to the importance of relations with others, to trust with others, and so forth. So this was by far not the main reason that the Camp David negotiations of 2000 broke down because of his lack of emotional intelligence, but he was really criticized for it, that it contributed to him to not thinking it was important to meet Arafat or talk face to face to him very often during Camp, uh, Camp David, that he didn't want to rely on previous negotiators who had formed relationships with the Palestinian negotiators, um, that he was often patronizing and arrogant to his own uh, people uh, as well as the Palestinians. And again, you could argue that Arafat would not have agreed to this agreement and that carries the main onus. Uh, but he, when he came out of power, said publicly uh, that he lacks sensitivity and he has to work on it and that hampered him uh, in terms of being able to form alliances while he was in power as well. And I had a kind of an interesting three-hour interview with him. Uh, and he also was speaking of that. So he's saying that's not the reason uh, that Camp David didn't work, uh, but I need to work on this in terms of building alliances in order to be able to affect policy. I'll move uh, quickly to Netanyahu. Everybody's wondering about Netanyahu. He's now the longest serving prime minister in Israeli history, and uh, look at Ben-Gurion as well. Uh, and so he was a prime minister from 1996 to 1999, and then six since uh, 2009. And many people have different perceptions of to what extent he's changed, if he's changed, to what extent he's only motivated by ideology, to what extent he's an opportunist, um, and so forth. And I would argue that like the other prime ministers that I've been discussing, he's heavily influenced by Likud ideology and constrained by that. So for instance, his father uh, was the personal assistant of Jabotinsky and worked closely with him. Uh, Netanyahu has several volumes of Jabotinsky in his office. He was a firm believer, as was Shamir in the greater land of Israel and keeping Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, um, as well as the Gaza Strip. He had been vehemently against Oslo and against the Palestinian state and uh, describes this powerfully in some of his books, if some of you have read them as well. But then he, he has some changes, some apparent changes that one could look at, right? One is that when he ran for office in 1996, even though he had been vehemently opposed to the Oslo process, he said he would abide by the previous government's decision and abide by the Oslo process, right? And part of it is you have a Barack and Netanyahu are kind of a newer generation of Israeli prime ministers that look at polls, and he knew that he wouldn't win the election because the Oslo process at the time was highly popular among Israelis. Then he says he'd never concede an inch, just like Shamir was adamant about, but he signs the Y and the Hebron agreements, which grant part of Hebron uh, to the Palestinian Authority. And uh, so the plan was for 13% of the West Bank, right? And then in 2009, he famously comes out in support of a two-state solution under certain conditions that we can talk about later if you'd like. So on one hand, 
he really arguably has not changed his perception of Palestinians like Shamir. He often thinks that they're still out to destroy Israel or that Hamas still uh, will do it, that there's no real partner to peace, uh, that peace is not urgent, that time is on Israel's side, right? So there's no urgency in reaching peace. And like Shamir, he often um, makes analogies to the past and maybe in a, uh, uh, in a past orientation, constantly referring to sometimes ancient but often to World War II, right? So even in uh, yesterday in the Saban Forum, he had a Skype uh, to the forum and he was again comparing um, Iran to Hitler. And some of you may agree, some of you may disagree with that comparison, but he's constantly making comparisons uh, to historical figures and situations where people like Shimon Peres and Ehud Barak um, and Yitzhak Rabin didn't, didn't, didn't engage in that and Barak immediately critiqued him for doing that, right? So you have different perceptions of what role these past analogies play. So he hasn't really changed his skepticism uh, in terms of the necess necessity for a state and the danger of a state or the true motives and aims of Palestinians, yet he's formally made these advances. So how can you explain that, right? Uh, on one hand, you can explain that through trying to uh, concede as little of his ideology as possible, and that he's still heavily influenced by ideology, but on the other hand, that he's still susceptible to some degree to international pressure and to domestic pressure in order to survive politically in his coalition and as prime minister, which helps explain some of these tactical changes. And one could argue that possibly he's intellectually made the change and he's made references to uh, demographic changes that necessitate Israel at some point moving to a two-state solution, but he again doesn't see any urgency of doing so and is very risk averse. So that's something I haven't talked about yet, uh, is risk propensity or risk aversion and what role that that plays. But arguably, uh, Netanyahu is risk averse, largely also in going to war. He hasn't invaded Lebanon. He hasn't initiated a big war. In 2012, he tried to keep it a smaller pillar defense war of a week and intended in 2014 to replicate the same thing. Um, but you had a changed Egyptian regime, which influenced not being able to get to a ceasefire as quickly. And then the tunnels were highlighted, and it got got more drawn out. But you could argue he's risk averse with those things as well as risk averse with peace negotiations in terms of highlighting the risks of those negotiations, which plays into for him uh, uh, the fears uh, of, of really seriously engaging in peace negotiations. And like Ehud Barak, who's of a different political party, he also suffers a little from emotional intelligence, also is not able to carry on or value long-lasting relationships with advisors. He has a lot of turnover among advisors in his different administrations, lots of people resigning or um, being uh, fired. And Dani Nave, who's a strong supporter of Netanyahu and wrote a book applauding Netanyahu, uh, was very hurt by the fact that he has polygraphs for his innermost circle, uh, for leaks and other things that he doesn't trust them, uh, and therefore, you see um, these kinds of things hampering his relationships with others, which also hamper his ability uh, to be critiqued uh, by those of a different uh, point of view and so forth, which is the same thing that hampered Ehud Barak. Uh, I'm going to quickly go to Sharon. And I think he's a fascinating figure as well. Uh, as many of you know, he fought in almost all the major Israeli wars, almost lost his life in 1948, famously crossed the Suez Canal and circled Egyptian troops in 1973, which no one thought he'd be able to do, um, and was very much a risk taker both militarily, which sometimes panned out as in 1973, and arguably sometimes did not pan out uh, as in 1982, where he got government authorization to go 
40 kilometers into Lebanon to go after the PLO and went all the way to Beirut and engaged in a broader war. Uh, and arguably, this dramatic shift of his from actually having former positions in the government where he builds settlements and talks about the importance of settlements and says that never, ever, ever uh, will Israel uh, dismantle a settlement or withdraw from any territory to this dramatic shift where he's the prime minister who dismantled most uh, settlers and, and took out all eight, 9,000 settlers from the Gaza Strip and all Israeli soldiers and took out the settlers within a five-day operation in the summer of 2005, right? So this is an incredible dramatic shift. Also dismantling four West Bank settlements at the time and promising to withdraw from most of the West Bank before his debilitating stroke uh, in 2006, January of 2006. So again, he goes through these dramatic shifts, right? And how can you explain these dramatic shifts? So on one hand, I think it's this real risk propensity, which you so middle militarily, and always also was willing to execute in terms of peace negotiations and withdrawals and unilateral withdrawals. And he exhibited this by leaving a party, the Likud party, which he had helped form, in which if he had stayed with the Likud, he would have 40 Likud members in a coalition, to risking establishing a new center party, Kadima, in order to follow through on more withdrawals from the West Bank, right? So this was a risky prop proposition uh, that he took on in order to execute these withdrawals. How did he uh, reach these decisions, right? On one hand, he's not past-oriented, as Shamir and Netanyahu is very much like Rabin, present-oriented, so therefore thinking that uh, things can change in the future in terms of the security situation uh, and that the Palestinians can change over time and looking at some of those signals. Partly ideologically, he's a fascinating person, right? He drew, grew up in a Labor Party community and Labor Party uh, family. Uh, he worked in the Rabin government, but later formed the Likud party. Uh, and I would argue that he adopted some elements of certain ideologies, but not others. So unlike Shamir Netanyahu, he was never wedded to the greater land of Israel for historical reasons or as an article of faith. But on the other hand, like Shamir Netanyahu, he thought time was on Israel's side and there was no urgency to reaching peace negotiations. So he was willing to engage in a unilateral withdrawal of the Gaza Strip and eventually most of the West Bank, but he didn't think he needed to do it in the framework of a peace negotiation and didn't think that that was urgent, that still time could be on Israel's side. And that's the way kind of ideology influenced him. And lastly, I'll talk a little bit in terms of him, in terms of his uh, uh, great emotional intelligence, right? Unlike Barack and unlike Netanyahu, uh, Sharon had a great uh, emotional intelligence. Everybody speaks to this, even political opponents who don't agree with him on anything. So for instance, one of the people I interviewed was Naomi Khazan. She's of the Meretz party, the leftmost Zionist party. She didn't agree with Sharon on anything. Yet they'd have regular lunches together. Um, he uh, would always ask, he valued relationships, he would ask everyone whether they're political opponents or not, how are they feeling, how was their sick wife, uh, um, and form personal relationships with them and valued those relationships. And if you look at his advisors, unlike Barack and Netanyahu, whose advisors were constantly shifting, and when Barack was no longer prime minister after eight months, all his advisors abandoned him. Unlike him, Sharon's advisors stuck with him for 30 years um, and um, challenged him, like his chief of staff, Dov class, who was more dovish than himself, and influenced uh, Barak's changes, as did Ehud Olmert. One of the reasons he was able to listen to different information and critiques is he surrounded himself by not younger yes-men, but people who were his age or older, who didn't have the exact political opinions, who challenged him on certain things and were saying, oh, the military thinks the costs of hanging on to the Gaza away, the benefits and so forth, and you have to look at these demographic changes. So it's that emotional intelligence that both allowed him 
to have relationships with people who would challenge his views and, and have uh, long conversations about it with him, and gave him the opportunity to actually implement those things afterwards, because he was able to form those alliances that enabled him to do that. So he's a really, I think, interesting figure that may not probably have been able to reach a peace agreement, because he didn't think it was urgent, he wasn't so keen on conceding parts of Jerusalem but probably would have withdrawn from most of the West Bank. And Dov Weisskloss, as chief of staff, said, you also have to recognize that when he was unilaterally withdrawing was the midst of the second intifada, right, where you had uh, constant suicide bombings in Israel. He said, if you had Sharon today with excellent security cooperation between Israel and the, and the PA, uh, and, Abu, and Abu Mazen having more authority than he had then, uh, perhaps he would have been more keen uh, for peace negotiations, I don't know. So this hopefully, I'm kind of as a grab bag of little snap, uh, you know, uh, little, little highlights, which probably are unsatisfactory of looking at how I use part of this framework at looking at the prime ministers. I think as a quick concluding uh, reflection on this, one thing that's interesting to note is that whether at any point in time had the prime minister been in office longer, one could have reached a peace agreement. So if Yitzhak Rabin hadn't been assassinated, uh, he was forming a more trusting relationship with Arafat. Some think that Arafat would never have been able to cut a deal. Um, but perhaps, right, if you look at Barak, only in office 18 months before the government collapsed, right when the Taba negotiations were happening, peace negotiations. A lot of negotiators at the time said we could have concluded an agreement if we had just had six more weeks, uh, and he was only in office 18 months. If you look at Shimon Peres, uh, he was, had a lifelong rivalry with Yitzhak Rabin. So after Rabin was assassinated, he didn't want to ride Rabin's coattails in terms of being elected uh, because of the assassination right in the aftermath of the assassination and didn't have elections uh, right away, postponed them and wanted to do it on his own merit and then lost the elections for a variety of reasons. But had he not made that decision, could he have made uh, more progress? And with um, Sharon, Ariel Sharon, if he hadn't had this debilitating stroke, uh, my research indicates, even though there's debate about this, that he would have withdrawn unilaterally from most of the West Bank. So what would that have meant in terms of events of the past decade uh, had he done so uh, is kind of an interesting thing uh, to think about. And I'll leave you with one last thought that I didn't kind of develop fully in terms of differentiating the prime ministers. But one thing that often has differentiated the varied ideologies of the prime ministers is whether they see, or to the extent that they see, kind of a permanently hostile world. And traditionally, the Likud ideology is often described as having this component of seeing kind of more permanent hostility in the world, which also makes some of the prime ministers less conducive to even American pressure, arguably, with some of the prime ministers. And on the other hand, uh, labor saying, well, this can change in terms of time, right? The, uh, the world and Israel's acceptance in the world is more malleable. And so famously, when Yitzhak Rabin came to office in 1992, in his first speech to the Knesset, he says, we're no longer a nation that dwells alone. We're no longer in isolation. And it became kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy that because of the Oslo process, about 60 countries recognized Israel in the next couple of years, kind of signifying its greater acceptance in the world. Uh, and often uh, prime ministers like Netanyahu emphasize the dangers in the world, the hostility in the world. But an interesting twist to this that I think is interesting to think about more recently, you see a little flip in terms of this. You see more the uh, left center uh, leaders uh, claiming that Israel is becoming more and more isolated in the world. And unless Israel reaches urgently a peace agreement with the Palestinians, it'll become even more isolated. So this is what Shimon Peres said uh, just over a year ago before he passed away, that Israel is increasingly isolated and he was very concerned about it. In contrast, if you look at Benjamin Netanyahu's last speech at the United Nations this September, he says there's a revolution going on 
and that Israel is being embraced in the world, that he has visited six continents, that the Indian prime minister uh, for the first time has visited Israel, that there's strengthened relations with China, that he's going to have a conference with Israel, Africa. Um, I believe the latest is it might be in Zambia next. And that, so one, you know, it's almost being flipped, right? Where, the, uh, where Perez was saying Israel has never been more isolated and Netanyahu was saying the world is embracing Israel, except for the UN and except for Iran and except for other countries that he talks about, right? So this is kind of an interesting kind of twist uh, to their outlooks where the Labor Party, which is always seen as uh, acceptance being malleable, saying, Yes, it's malleable, but if Israel doesn't do certain things urgently, it's going to become more isolated. And Likud saying, we don't need to urgently pursue peace because, look, we're forming relations and being accepted without it, right? And so those different perceptions are really coloring the outlook and policy prescriptions as well.